Sister Vicki and our spirit-filled soul sisters. Let's thank the Lord for them. Them sisters praising the Lord. And we want to thank God for Joe Ross being with us today, the youngest, the youngest drummer in Raleigh, North Carolina, and the best. Good to see you, Brother Joel and Brother Ross. Again, thank you for giving us the gift, allowing the gift to be a part of our worship. Blessings on you, Sister Ross, and the family. But we thank God for Joe Ross. Amen. Yeah, like I was saying, that when he was back a few weeks ago, I hadn't seen him since COVID, and he didn't shot up a few inches. Amen. These young folk growing on us. I was talking to my grandson. Look at that growing. Everybody hitting a growth spurt. And to all our young people in the sanctuary, is that Sister Emery back there? Emery and Haley. Amen. God bless you. Good to see you here today. And to all our young people, we want you to be encouraged. School is kicked in and you're dealing with all the stuff going on with that, but the Lord got your back. He got your back. And to all our young people online, we just want you to know, be encouraged and continue to do your best in school. Put your best foot forward for you are part of a season of life that's like no other. But the Lord will see you through. And he always has young people that he's raising up to meet the challenges of their generation. So let, let's don't be in despair. Let's be encouraged because the Lord will make a way. Let us pray. Father, as we continue in the teaching of your word today, we ask that you would open our eyes that we might see the wonderful things in your word. As the congregational church, those who are listening and learning online, we're praying that this emphasis on the priority of the Great Commission will light a fire in Raleigh as the fire begins to burn in us here at Congregational Church. We're asking you to show us deeper things, take us to a more spiritually mature understanding of how we must live and serve in these last and evil days. And by your grace, and as we depend on your Holy Spirit, transform us, transform us into more of what the Congregational Church should be to meet the challenge of these last and evil days. So teach us now in Jesus' name, Grant us understanding and discernment and wisdom. May this word be a word that will help us all to keep following Jesus in biblical discipleship. This is our prayer. Amen. We're in part five of the priority of the Great Commission. Part five of the priority of the Great Commission. If you one thing you got down pat now is the Great Commission, right, church? You got down pat now that we are disciples. We are Christian disciples. Before we are anything else, we are disciples, followers of Christ. You've been introduced to the fact that we are growing in a Christian worldview to where we're seeing the world through the eyes of the biblical revelation more. A worldview, a perspective. As we say, we're walking by faith, right? Not by sight. We're also learning from parts three, one through four that, that this worldview is so important to understand in the season we're passing through. Because what the Lord is doing in the church now is not what he was doing 50 or 60 years ago. We must be in season. We must be in the timing of God's prophetic plan. 
We also said there are benefits from following him in discipleship. Great and precious promises to those who prioritize the great commission of going into all the world and making disciples. And today, if you don't mind, I'd like to go a little bit further. Just a little bit further. Because we are on a journey. And it's not over yet. Though it may have some curves up ahead, we got to hang in the curve. And sooner or later, the curve going to come straight way. And oh, don't we love the straight ways. When all you got to do is just look ahead and ride. But oh, you got to deal with the curves. Because if you lose it in the curve, you won't find the straight way. So while we're in the curve, we got to hold the steering wheel a little bit tighter. Got to make sure our foot is ready to hit the brake when necessary. But when we hit the straight way, put your hand down there like that on your steering wheel. Put the pedal to the metal. We're on a journey. It has curves and straight ways. So the pride of the Great Commission, I want to read the text, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. I believe our media people who are doing an excellent job, have it up on the screen. If you don't have your Bibles or cell phones or smart devices, there's no way you can get around that word. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Let's hear the greatest mission of the church from the lips of the king himself. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went away to Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. But when they saw him, some worshiped him, but some what? Doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority, don't forget that, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Based on that authority in heaven and earth, you go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, all races, all nationalities, all ethnic groups. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And here it is again, the methodology, teaching them to obey all things I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The Great Commission. We'll be dealing with this for quite some time, the priority of the Great Commission, because not only does the gospel of the kingdom save us and forgive us, right? The forgiven are called to action. We're called to action. And the Great Commission calls us to the action of following him in discipleship. Now, my brothers and sisters, this discipleship is the primary methodology of growth in Christian life and living, spiritual growth. It's called discipleship. We are learners of Christ. Is that right? We are submitted to his teachings and all of us are still growing no matter what level of maturity we have right now. You still, you and I are still growing as his disciples. So everybody is a disciple. If you're in Christ, you're his Christian disciple. There's no waiting out, make that optional. As it says on our front of our bulletin, you see on the front of your bulletin, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It's a command to be what? Obeyed. And we're going to go into the nuts and bolts of this. We talked about worldview. We talked about benefits. We talked about the, the importance of the Great Commission. And for a church where we are in our life and mission right now, as we're implementing and thinking about transition, in the days ahead, one of the pastoral challenges in my role while I'm here with you is to help lead that process. And leading a congregation in change and transition 
is challenging. And I'm going to go back to the old, it's not, a, it's not a proverb, but it's something we said at the beginning uh, when I came here. And it was taken from the book, Leading Congregational Change. And it said there in the opening line, if you keep doing, quote, if you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been getting. Quote, end of quote. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you'll keep getting what you've been what? Getting. Anybody want something fresh and new? I do. I do. I, I mean, I, I want to experience, as it says in Roman, newness of life. This qualitative newness, and we'll position my brothers and sisters at Congregational Church to experience it, but this season we're passing through. So we hear what this word says. If you keep doing what you've been doing, you keep getting what you've been getting. But he also says this quote, but Christ established his church to proclaim and demonstrate salvation to the world. See, it's more than about us. It's about a world that's lost. And he says the call of the Great Commission is just as relevant and urgent today as it was when Jesus gave it to his first disciples thousands of years ago after his, res his resurrection from the dead. And our assertion is that the healthy church will have a holistic understanding of the gospel. And that will be, and that it will be, reaching people for Christ at the same time that it's discipling each other and ministering to each other as members of the body of Christ. So today I want to challenge us to keep pressing toward this goal of fulfilling the Great Commission, because along the journey, I said there can be some curves. There can be some curves. And I want to deal with today something that I just need to deal with, if you don't mind. Because in any local church or any church life or even in our personal lives, as we seek to follow Jesus, there are things in our life that you got to deal with. I'm going to call them the sacred cows. Sacred cows. So today, <laughs> I want to deal with this issue of if we're going to fulfill the Great Commission, you got to deal with some sacred cows in our lives. And in the church. Yeah, you got quiet on me there, yeah. <laughs> quiet on that. Sacred cows. Yeah, let's look at this issue. What is a sacred cow? You know, in the Hindu religion, they consider cows as sacred. You don't mess with them cows. If a cow walk across the street and go as slow as you just wait till the cow cross the street. You don't mess with the cow. You don't disrespect the cow. You don't say anything negative about the cow because it's sacred, set apart. Don't criticize the cow. Don't touch the cow. because it's a sacred cow. Now that's where some get this term from, the Hindu uh, revering of the cow. Let me go a little further with this definition of what a sacred cow is and see if you can relate to it. Maybe a few that's in my life, your life, and maybe in the church. A sacred cow is a figure of speech something that's considered immune from being questioned or criticized. 
You don't you don't question it. You know, you don't criticize it. This idiom is thought to originate though in the English, American English, and it, it also speaks of things that we consider a protective interest, a protective interest. It's something that we're so interested in and believe that it's so important that we protect it. We guard it. We don't let anybody criticize it. It's a favorite. It's, it's something that we just don't want anybody to deal with. Sacred cow. You got any in your life? In a sacred cows, any any place where you don't go there. You don't speak on that. You don't deal with that because it's sacred cow. Well, I'm gonna say the best to the end of the message because I, I want to be more specific. But you got, the, you got the gist, what a sacred cow is? Well, let me give you a biblical rendition of a sacred cow. Open your Bibles to Genesis, I mean, sorry, Exodus chapter 32. Because here in the biblical record, we, we see where even in the life of Israel, when, when the leadership was on the mountain, when Moses was on the mountain, attending to the word of the Lord to come back and help the people. Amen. They got tired of them being away. And let's see what they did. Exodus 32, beginning at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together Aaron. You know who Aaron was, right? He was the Lord, he was Moses' brother, his spokesman, the one who helped him when he had to speak to Pharaoh. Right? They Moses is on an extended mission trip. And they got they got tired of not hearing Moses come back. So they went to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, as for this Moses, this is disrespect. As for this Moses, Moses, the one who learned his lesson on the backside of Midian. Moses, who ran, but now Moses, who's the leader. Moses, who had learned humility now and had led them out of Egyptian bondage under the Pharaoh's tyranny. Moses, who led him through the Red Sea. Moses, who appealed to God to have mercy on them when they wanted to go back and eat cucumbers and lemons. Moses, who was their leader. We don't know what's become of him. You hear the disrespect? How soon they forget. But as for this man named Moses, who brought us up out of the land. We don't know what's become of him. And Aaron said to them, and here's a very good example of weak leadership. Giving in. Throwing up the, the white flag, I surrender. Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. You know, they wanted a God, right? So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears, brought them to Aaron, the leader. And he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And so when Aaron saw it, he built an altar. Now, not only does he have an idol, 
but now he builds an altar to it. And Aaron made the proclamation, says, tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. My, my, my. Look at verse 6. They rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings. That is, we talking about that today, won't we? In Sunday school, and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, that don't mean they were worshiping. That means they were filling their selfish appetites around a false god, a sacred cow. And not only that, it led to raunch immorality because they had forgotten who brought them out of Egypt. They made, you know, it's just like Romans says, when men abandon the true and living God, they'll make an image that they can bow down to. Sacred cows, idols, things people idolize. An idol is what you put before God and try to act like it is God. This is what happened back then. But look at verse 7 very carefully. And the Lord said to Moses, Moses up there getting the word from the Lord. So the Lord sees what's going on under the weak leadership of Aaron. Is that right? And immediately he gets back to the leader and there's a warning sign. You know, that's one thing about uh, the Lord. He'll always send a warning sign. You know, in your car when something is about to go wrong, on that electronic screen we got now with all these computers in the car, what comes up? A warning light. Something's wrong in the engine. Need to go get it dealt with. So it is in the body of Christ and in the nation of Israel. Whenever something's going wrong, the Holy Spirit will send a warning sign. There's no need to deal with that. And Moses needed to deal with this sacred cow. Look at verse 7. The Lord said to Moses, get down, get up and go down for your people (laughs) whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And they turned aside quickly. They have turned aside how? Quickly. Out of the way which I commanded them and they have made themselves a molded cow. Can I say a sacred cow? And worshipped it, even sacrificed to it, and said, this is your God. Replace the true and the living God with an idol. A sacred cow. This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. There's a lesson in this text for the church today. The danger of holding on or making a sacred cow. Because when you get on this journey, we've been talking about part of what the challenge is in these last days is to stay away from sacred cows. In your life, my life, in the church life, Not create or make something to take God's place. And it's so easy today in this deceptive time of confusion, spiritual deception, false gospels, false teachings in the church, all around us. As Timothy said, people will leave the faith, paying heed to seducing spirits and the teachings of demons. Sacred cows. Idols will always lead you away from God, church. Always. Always. Join me in 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. Because when we're on 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 20, but when we're on this road of discipleship, That's one of the greatest needs for discernment is to make sure we don't get seduced or called away by any sacred cows. 
And how did that happen? Listen to what 1 John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. It says there, and we know, that means us, the church, right? We know that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, has come and done what? And has given us an understanding. See, an understanding that we may know him who is true. See, church got the truth. Jesus has given us the truth because he is the truth. The Son of God has come. Now, he hadn't come back in, the, in Exodus 32 yet, not in the form he's come in the church age. But we have something to make sure we don't get sidetracked. The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. See, that's what discipleship emphasizes. Not a holler, but an understanding. A thinking, a mind that knows the truth. See, that's what discipleship produces. Not only that, that we may know him who is true. See, you got to make sure. That's what discipleship emphasizes. Your relationship with Jesus Christ. One-on-one, -on -one, right? That you may know him who is true, and we are in him who is what? True. And in his son, Jesus Christ. Y'all got it. This is the true God and eternal life. See, ain't nobody else. Ain't nobody else. And in this time of pluralism, I've been telling you for years, there ain't no other gods. There ain't no other. People can choose to believe whatever they want to. But for us who know him who is true, those of us who are in Christ, those of us who are disciples of the King of Kings, you may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his son, Jesus Christ. Here it is. This is the true God and eternal life. Let's read on. Verse 21, and little children, Keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourself from sacred cows. Keep yourself from anything that'll move Jesus out of the way and replace him with what you think he is when it's not him. Brothers and sisters, on this road of great commission, you and I got to deal with sacred cows because there's always something coming to move Jesus over to the side. And many have been derailed. Many have been hoodwinked. Many have been deceived because they got the wrong understanding. And they've replaced the true and the living God that we know through Christ with a sacred cow. You don't mind if I deal with it today. Because one, of, I read an article, by the way, there's a little something here, and I was saying, they were talking about what's the challenges today of pastoring in today's culture? I was reading some research about what's the toughest part of pastoring? And in this article, it said one of the toughest parts of pastors leading churches today is helping people follow Jesus. Making sure they're following the right Jesus. The true Jesus. Because I have to say, there's so many sacred cows in the church today. There's a reason why Jesus cleaned the temple when he came on the scene. A lot of sacred cows when he came on the earth. First thing, he went in there and cleaned up. Get rid of all your sacred cows. My house will be called a house of prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. Jesus cleansed the temple. Because he had to get rid of the sacred cows. 
that Judaism had produced. It kept people from knowing who he truly was. Think about it. the temple that they were meeting at to be the place where they were meeting at, where they were supposed to be worshiping the true and living God, had turned into a place where they were worshiping idols, worshiping money, worshiping themselves, worshiping their own created sacred cow. And first thing Jesus did, went to the temple. So he pulled out a whip. Now what did I tell you about Jesus? He don't like sacred cows. He don't like anything that replaces him and leads people the wrong way. So if I go a little further today, I might have to take two or three parts to deal with these sacred cows. It's a bunch of them. It's a whole lot of them running around. A whole lot of them in our lives and in the church. So I hope you got a kind of working definition of a sacred cow and what we as Christians should be able to spot a sacred cow, right? Because this is what the first point of this message is. Jesus Christ expects undivided loyalty. He won't, he nobody co-pilot. He ain't asking nobody to ride with him. He's asking everybody just to follow him. That's it. He, he don't need no help. He don't need some created sacred cow to come along and help him. He's Lord all by itself. And this is a point of biblical discipleship. Jesus Christ expects undivided loyalty from his church. Undivided. Total allegiance. He's in charge. Calling the shots. Let's look at this very carefully, biblically, because if we're following Jesus, we got to make sure that we don't let any sacred cows get in the way. John 6, if you don't mind, John 6. I'm kind of ahead of myself today. Amen. John 6, look at verse 44. Listen to this. John 6, 44, talking about sacred cows. Now, this is a message that also says we're protected from it, though, church, as long as we don't get seduced. Because the person that's in charge of building the church is who? Not us, him. And listen to what he says in John 6, 44. No one comes to me unless the father who sent me draws him. See, ain't nobody took the initiative on their own. If we're here today, it's because the Father drawed us to the Son. It wasn't you. It wasn't me. We were out there walking in darkness. Couldn't see for not see. Totally cut off. Totally lost. When you're lost, you don't know where y'all. Last time I checked. So we were the ones that was lost and he drew us out of our lostness to his son. Look at the text. No one can come to me unless who? The father who sent me draws him and I will raise him up. That's what Jesus meant when he says, if I be lifted up, if I be lifted up on the cross, if I die for the sins of the world, not singing songs, but if I die for the sins of the world, if I be lifted up on that cross, I'll draw people to me. Because some who will say they're lost, I'm lost. I'm trying to find my way out. Well, here's the cross. And the Father draws us to the Son. Sacred cows don't draw you. They seduce you. Sacred cows distract you and move you off point. But the true and the living God will only draw you to Christ. He won't draw you to nothing else. You won't be confused about who Jesus is. 
Because when the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to who he is, when he opened our eyes to who he really was, right? Oh, what a joy came into our life. When the light came on. Look at John 6, 60. John chapter 6, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, heard what? You got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. When many of his disciples heard this saying, hey, that's a hard saying, bro. Who can understand? And when Jesus knew in himself, his disciples complained about this. He said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the son of man ascending where he was before? It is the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 63 very carefully. It is the Holy Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spiritual and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe. And he even knew who would betray him. Because Judas had a sacred cow. that kept him from seeing Christ. And the sacred cow was his own ambition and greed. Remember, that's a sacred cow. And then look at verse 65. And he said, therefore, I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. And Jesus said to the 12, now here he is, the, the 12. Now this is the same 12 in Matthew 28 where he gave the Great Commission. Same 12. So here, before we get to the Great Commission, he's speaking to these men who would be the first leaders of the church. Then he asked them, verse 67. I'm sorry. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Then verse 67, Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Gave him opportunity. They wanted to see if they had any sacred cows. And look at it. They, they had it right. But Simon Peter answered and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Verse 69. And also we have come to believe. You got it? I believe. And not only do I believe, I know that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One, the Anointed One. You know I got to say it, the only one. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Oh boy, that ain't no sacred cow there. That's the real deal. They got it right. They saw him for who he is. And look at verse 7. Jesus said, did I not choose you? The 12. And even in his grace, one of you is a devil. He knew Judas was a devil from the start. And he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So my brothers and sisters, the church has a protection from sacred cows, from being deceived. From putting things before the Lord that we think is the Lord, but it's not the Lord. Because you've been given a true understanding of him who is true. You've been given a revelation of who the Christ is. You and I have been revealed. This has been revealed to us in the glorious face of Jesus Christ. So the question has to be raised. Why are so many sacred cows in the church then? In some of our lives, we got sacred cows. Well, I'm going to give you this one. To deal with that, you just got to make sure that Jesus is the most important person in your life. You just got to make sure that you love him more than anybody else. And nobody's going to get in the way or nothing's going to get in the way of keeping me from following him. 
Let's go to Luke 14, 25. See, this is what discipleship emphasizes. It don't lift up no social organizations. It don't lift up no fraternities, no sorority, excuse me. It don't lift up none of our sacred cows. It don't lift up things that try to take the place of Christ. The thing we give more attention to than we do him. Y'all still love me? See, I got to realize some of this stuff sacred cows to you. You think it's more important than Jesus Christ. Pastor, how can you say that? How can you say that? <laughs> well, I'm a human being just like you. Some of our sacred cows is our sports. Come on, brother, let me deal with us. Some of us can't even worship because we're thinking about the NFL. Help get done, Pastor. I got the game at one o'clock. My sacred cow is calling, and I don't want to miss a play. Used to be there myself. Used to be there. Oh, yeah, wouldn't even go to church early in my life. But I want to make sure I watch every game and didn't miss a play. Amen. Every game and didn't miss a play. Right? Sacred cow. Well, that's how I can understand it. I ain't got that problem no more. Because I, I done met somebody. Right. Amen. And, and it ain't more important than a guy running down the field with a ball in his hand. Right. And later, can I deal with you just a little bit? If you don't mind. You got some sacred cows. <laughs> now, some of these ladies' sacred cows, though, is, you know, us brothers, we love them sacred cows, especially when you're cooking that good meal. And you got that meal on your mind more than you got the Lord on your mind. See, the brother, we give you a pass on that one. But my brother says, all I'm trying to say, even the little things of life that we think are so unharmful and not really an issue can become a sacred cow because Jesus Christ demands. Listen, he ain't asking for it. He's demanding total allegiance. And he must be first in everything. Everything. Look at Luke 14. Now, some of the things that we don't even think are harmful are keeping us from selling out to Jesus. Look at Luke 14, 25. Now, great multitudes went with him and he turned to say it to them, if anyone comes to me, does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he or she cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, this begs for interpretation. I've said it before. The word hate in the Greek simply means to love less. So he's saying, if anyone wants to come after me and you love anybody more than you love me, your mother, father, sister, brother, children, even your own life, you can't be my disciple. Because discipleship demands total allegiance and loyalty before anybody. You see, this, this is a problem because sometimes people in our family become sacred cows. We're helping, we're doing the right thing. But sometimes they can get in the way of you following Jesus. And when it becomes to that point, that's got to deal with that. And when, listen, my brother, sister, he's simply saying, you got to love me more than you love anybody else. And he's got the right to demand it because he loves you more than anybody else. He loved you and me more than he loved himself. That's why he died on that cross. That's why he came to this earth. And my brothers and sisters, as I've told you many times before, when we love him first before any human relationship, we're better in all those relationships. 
better father, mother, cousin, whatever the case may be. So that's why he's saying put him first because we can't be what we need to be to others without him first being number one. Matter of fact, he the one who made you. He's the one who gave you your identity. This is why the Great Commission emphasizes Jesus Christ above and beyond everybody, even our sacred cows. One other one, Colossians, I'm about done. Colossians, I'm about done. <laughs> Chapter 1, verse 15. What the point is, is that if you prioritize Jesus Christ, you won't deal with sacred cows. First chapter of Colossians 1, 15. Let me read these for you. These should give us great comfort. Listen, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, by Jesus, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. The visible things that you can see and the invisible things you can't see. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things created through him and for him. Y'all see it. And he is the head of the body, the church. Now can I stay there just a minute? Because one of the biggest sacred cows in the church is people thinking they are running something. <laughs> Pastors can have sacred cow. Deacons can have sacred cow. Trustees can have this sacred cow. Let me tell you something. Ain't nobody running nothing unless you're the one that's the head. Ain't none of us the head. As I've said before, all we're here to do is do what he say in the responsibilities we have. That's sacred cow in the church. Hey, we running something. We controlling something. Now deal with it for a deal with you. Because I would dare not try to get in the way of running his church. Listen to it. All things were made by him, through him, and for him. He is before all things. And in him all things consist or hold together. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. That means first place. First place. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by whether things on earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. That's why I say ain't got no room for nobody else. The last time I checked, he's the only one on the cross. And, and then the cross of Christ. That, that should guard us from sacred cows. Why would we want to sacrifice to a sacred cow, some idol, when the king of kings has sacrificed himself? My brothers and sisters, can I get practical now as I come to closure? You got any sacred cows in your life? Congregational church as a congregation, do we have any sacred cows in the church that might get in the way of our future forward strategic planning? Think about it. Do we have any sacred cow in the church? Well, I'm going to go to part six next week because I want to deal with a few of them specifically. If you don't mind. I'll probably wear my armor in here next. 
Chris Bouquet, can we order an armor suit? <laughs> oh, yeah, Pastor going there. Yes, I am. Yes, 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 I am. Because Jesus loves us too much to tolerate sacred cows. He's too worthy to be competing with an idol. He's too majestic to be compared to our created human thinkings. He's too divine to be related and reduced to humanity. He's too powerful to be playing with things that have no power. I'm tempted to start calling them out right now. Tempted to do it. To you who are online, do you have any sacred cows? Yeah, you replace Christ with some idol in your own life, some person, some issue, some people, some cause, some social organization, something you're involved in that you spend more time with that and then you do with the Lord? What's the idol? What's the sacred cow? Because as we go forward in these last days, if you don't deal with these sacred cows, they're going to deal with you. Because hear me well today, the flesh and the spirit are in opposition to one another. And last time I checked, the only thing the Holy Spirit glorifies is Jesus Christ. The only thing he gives credence to is Jesus Christ. The only thing he gives uh, revelation about is the glorious one, Jesus Christ. And my brothers and sisters, we're going to deal with the sacred cows so that we can get a clearer vision of going where we have not been before. So on Wednesday night, on Disciple Talk, Bible Study, guess what I'm going to be talking about? Sacred cows. That's when I can sit down right here at the podium and explain it to you. Amen. My brothers and sisters, we have a great opportunity before us. And we got to be excited. We've got to be encouraged. And we've got to know that greater is he who is in you than he that is in the world, in his sacred cow. I know it ain't going to be easy to t stomach some of the stuff I got to say next week. I know it ain't going to be easy. But just like when my mama, Marceline Smith, Wade Smith, when we got sick on Davie Street in Washington, they pull out that three sixes. Y'all remember the three sixes? Hey Amen, that three sixes. Boy, they need to put a skull and crossbone on that stuff. <laughs> but when you put it in you, anything that wasn't supposed to be in you came out. We got to get some 360s. So anything ain't supposed to be in my life going to come out. And everything ain't supposed to be in the church got to come out. So get ready. I'm bringing the three sixes next week. Because I love you. My mom and daddy love. That's why they gave it to us. Church. Deal with the cows. Deal with anything competing for time in your life with Jesus Christ. Because it's not worth it. Not in this hour we're passing through. So we all got to go further than we've been before. Take seriously to rid ourselves of any sacred cows. If you're here today online and you don't know Jesus Christ, we beg you today, the biggest sacred cow is yourself. The biggest sacred cow is yourself. But let me tell you something. The king of kings, the one we worship, his name is Jesus Christ. He loves you so much just the way you are that he took your place on the cross. 
so that he could die for your sins, forgive you, rise from the dead, and you believe that he's the son of God. And not only will he forgive you, he'll give you a new purpose. He'll call you to discipleship. He'll give you a mission that you've never had before. And it'll go not only in this earthly realm, but into eternity, where you'll spend eternity with the king of kings. My brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you, pray right now for people who don't know the Lord. That they'll see the gospel. They'll hear the gospel. They'll hear the gospel. They'll hear the word of the Lord that calls them to confess and believe. For the word of God says, you've confessed with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew, Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you recognize you got a sin problem and you can't fix it yourself, I got the answer and the solution. Call on the one who will forgive your sins. Call on him and see if he won't answer. Call on him and say, Lord, I believe save me from my sins. And he'll do just that. I got any witnesses? Got any witnesses? And if you don't have a church home, you need to have a church home. You need to be under covering. You need to be in a membership, a fellowship of other disciples so you can be encouraged. There's nobody following the Lord all by themselves. If you're backslidden, hear me, congregation of church and anybody else. If you're backslidden, you know you done messed up. Come on home. Come on home. Home is home. Come on back home. We, we, we ain't got no condemnation for nobody, but we do have this. We got a ring to put back on your finger to remind you you're a child of God. We got a feast for you to say, we just thank God you're back in the house. Come on back home. Stop living on the fringes and listening to your sacred cows. Come on back home. Come on back. As our worship leaders lead us in worship, let the Holy Spirit do his work. Though the clouds may hang over, there will be a brighter day in that land they call heaven. God shall wipe all tears away.
more no more sorrow church no more weeping <laughs> peace and joy every day and beyond like crystal river thank you lord my god he shall wipe all tears away no more sorrow no more weeping peace and joy peace and joy every day every day for beside for beside my crystal river oh yeah God shall wipe all tears away. We shall be home, the Lamb of God, sitting on the throne. There'll be no more crying and no more weeping and trouble. I like this verse. Oh, the joy <laughs> of meeting Jesus. Mortal tongues cannot put rain. For we know we shall be holding. Gush and wine, all tears away. Oh, the joy, oh, the joy of meeting Jesus. Oh, yeah. No more to tongue cannot portray. Even for we know, for we know, we shall be holding. But God shall wipe. God shall wipe. We shall wipe all tears away. Come on, help us. Say we shall be holding. The Lamb of God. Say we're sitting on the throne. On the throne. How do you know there will be no more? No more crying. No more weeping. No more weeping. All our trouble will be gone. We got to sing hallelujah. There'll be joy forevermore. Thank you, Lord. When we reach. Will we be that of the show? Come on, lift up your voice and say, We shall, we shall be home. Thank you, Lord. Lamb of God. We'll be sitting on the throne. Sitting on the throne. There will be no more crying. There will be no more crying. No more weeping. No more weeping. All our troubles, troubles will be gone. Church, we can shout hallelujah. When we reach, when we reach, when we reach the other shore, when we reach the other shore, when we reach the other shore, won't that be good news, church? When we reach the other shore, when we reach the other shore. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Deacon Walston, our worship leaders. Remain standing for the benediction. I won't keep you standing long. But if we prioritize the Great Commission and keep making it the core of our church life, we don't have to worry about sacred cows. And guess what? Just like they just led us in worship, we will reach the other shore. My brothers and sisters, let the godless sing for joy. It's fitting for the pure to praise him. Praise the Lord with the melodies of the lyre. Make music for him on a 10 string harp. Sing a new song and praise him like we just did. For the word of the Lord holds true and we can trust everything he does. He loves what is just and good and his unfailing love, the Lord will fill the earth. Receive this benediction, go from this place knowing that you're loved of God, that you're his Christian disciple, that you are the one he's using to fill the earth with the good news of Jesus Christ. Go and help somebody who's in despair. Show them there's a way out of the lostness. Give them hope. And one last thing, if you don't mind, kick all the sacred cows out of your life and out of the church for we can glorify him even more. Go, my brothers and sisters, because he loves you. And may his peace and love protect you throughout this week. Our young people online and here, be blessed and encouraged. Your church stands behind you. Go, my brothers and sisters, and represent the king in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you each and every one. <laughs>